evening, everyone. Um, it's great to be back. As Daniel said, I came first in 2013 here and have visited about four times since. And one of the things I come away with every time is that we're very reserved in England and you get this real can-do attitude in the United States. And I hope you're going to see in what I'm going to tell you um, some of the progress um, we've made. So I'm, I'm still a practicing urological surgeon, so kidneys, prostates, bladders, that kind of thing in Essex. I'm also a medical director in my hospital group responsible for innovation, research and transformation. I'm an academic too at my local um, university, Anglia Ruskin University, and really where I lead innovation and enterprise, and that's really because alongside my PhD and surgical training, I did four startups, raised five million pounds and exited them all. Some were um, amazing successes and some were total disasters, um, but I survived them. Now, in England, that was really unusual for a clinician to do that, but in the United States, it was fairly commonplace. Um, and then 10 years ago, Sir Bruce Keogh, who was the National Medical Director for the Health Service in England, um, invited me to come and take on this new role of National Clinical Director for Innovation. So the first time that I'm aware of, a nation had taken a clinician and put them in a leadership role for a whole nation's healthcare innovation. And one of the reasons he wanted me to do that, he said, we need you to help us address the inequalities, get the latest, greatest things taken up across our nation. We want you to grow the life science economy in the UK. We want you to become our senior clinical advisor, not just across the NHS, but government ministries, arm's length bodies, public sector, private sector, and foreign governments that came to see us about healthcare and life science innovation. And the last thing um, Sir Bruce said to me was, he said, Tony, we just want you to make the NHS the go-to place on the planet for healthcare innovation, but you've got no money and no power, so go and see what you can do. And if any of you have been to the NHS, you'll know that's exactly how we work. Now, that sounds like a huge problem, doesn't it? How are you going to make what is turning 75 years this July, the world's first universal healthcare system and the world's oldest one, how are we going to take that and turn it into the most innovative one? It sounds like a huge problem, doesn't it? And this is um, another huge problem. This is Jean-Simon Bartholomew's 18th century painting of what was thought to be the most intractable problem in ancient history, um, which is the Gordian knot. So it was a knot nearly 2,000 years ago that was so tight that no one could untie it. So Alexander the Great came to that town, took out his sword and just sliced through the knot, cutting it open. No one had told him you couldn't cut it with your sword, you were meant to untie it. So he brought new thinking and new action to a problem that everyone said couldn't be solved. Doesn't it feel like that in healthcare sometimes at the moment? So in the National Health Service, we would have a number of issues that I would say are our Gordian knot, our problems that people think are too difficult to be solved. And more of the same is not going to do it. And that's why I like coming to NextMed, because you meet new people, new ideas, new approaches, new ways of doing things. And if you want to work with the National Health Service, it's no good coming along to me and saying, we've got this great solution. Why don't you buy 100,000 of them? You're a big healthcare system. That doesn't work. You need to understand our challenges, the issues we're facing in our workforce. We, have a we are the fifth largest employer on the planet, 1.4 million people, and yet we have a 10% vacancy rate right across our system, 140,000 full-time vacancies. Reboot and recovery. Before the pandemic, we had a waiting list. After it, nearly 7 million people are on the waiting list for outpatient and inpatient treatment. And yet we spend, I think last year, 156 billion pounds. How can we use that money to get patients seen and treated quicker? Health inequalities, laid, we've heard about it this week on this stage, haven't we? Laid bare by the pandemic. We need to get serious about sorting that out. Net zero, the NHS has stepped forward as the first healthcare system in the world 
to produce a national plan. We will reach net zero by 2040 and all our supply chains by 2045. So if you want to sell to the National Health Service, the world's largest single payer of health care in 2045, your company has to be net zero in all its supply chains. So we've stepped forward and said that's serious. Long-term plan, and this was a document we published a few years ago, looking at how can we have excellent health care from gradle right through to old age where patients are empowered to live healthier, more productive lives. And then the last challenge is cost efficiency. When I first came to, in 2013, everyone said, it's terrible, Tony. He said, we spent $2.7 trillion this year on health care. It can't carry on growing. I think this year you spent $4 trillion. 10 years later, and yet life expectancy in the United States is starting to go down, so you're spending more money and not getting the return. So we need not just to do things differently, we need to do different things. We can't carry on doing more of the same. So in NHS England, I sit in an organisation known as the Accelerated Access Collaborative. Now, I could spend the whole talk talking about that and the great programmes we have, some of which are listed up here, but I'm going to focus on one of those programmes today because I brought some of our entrepreneurs with us. Now, when I first came here in 2013, I just thought, how can I, what Daniel was saying earlier, how can I bottle some of what goes on here, some of what you see and learn? How can I take it back to the National Health Service and give us that can-do American approach and enthusiasm? And so, I, as a, someone who'd been an entrepreneur in the NHS, and I felt when I, when I uh, came over here, I felt there are lots of entrepreneurs in healthcare. I'm, I was on my own in England, almost. There were two or three of us, perhaps. So we founded something called the NHS Clinical Entrepreneur Program. And that was a um, program that um, would provide education and training, less than full time if you wanted to take time out of your training, commercial mentors, we have over 250 world leading mentors, we connect them into customers and funding, we help support them with testing and trialling, networking events and industry days. And rather than hear from me what the uh, programme is about, I thought I would let you hear it from them. The programme is a really brilliant way to tap into the healthcare innovation ecosystem and to open up a whole world of opportunities for you and your projects. There's a world plan programme, you get to meet great people and you belong to the family of clinical entrepreneurs this is brilliant. You're meeting your tribe. These are people who have the energy of being innovators. Uh, also to meet some amazing uh, contacts and networking and just to be exposed to some globally relevant companies. I think one of my favourite moments on the programme so far has been presenting to the Medical Advisory Group and the CEO of the NHS, Amanda Pritchard. Being directors, be it midwives, doctors, physiotherapists, people that I would have never have been able to be in front of. At every pit stop I've always come away with some surprise connection. Without the Clinical Entrepreneurship Programme I never would have got this idea off the ground. Gained lots of business skills, pitching practice, support, advice, experience, questioning, coaching and a strategy. The opportunity to think about how you can get your innovation into the NHS. The mentor scheme has been absolutely phenomenal. To go from not wanting to stand up and present to standing up in a room full of several hundred people and doing a presentation that I enjoyed. Everybody's really there to help you, support you and encourage each other. Don't even think twice about it, just do it. It's an amazing community, amazing place where an idea, a far-fetched idea by two young naive medical students can become a funded reality. So see what happens when you come to NextMed, a programme like this starts. So let me give you some of the reasons to believe. It sounds great, doesn't it? So MediShout is a company founded by an orthopaedic trainee. He's raised five million pounds now. What does it do? It unifies your help desks in a hospital. So whether that's facilities, stock and ordering, IT, medications, instead of having to hang on the phone and say, you're number five in the queue, we're really busy, we will answer you shortly, 
shortly, you photograph it, you type a little message into the app through AI, it works out what it is and it automatically sends it to the right department and gets that sorted. In my hospital trust, there are 16,000 employees, 11,000 have downloaded and regularly used the app and last year they sent 100,000 shouts through this to the various help desks, meaning they don't have to hang on the phone. You heard from Hamid a moment ago, this is the Rainbow Drone Squadron, green battery operated drones that can fly around 70 um, kilometers, um, fixed wing. We had a dream and our dream was could we create a national air grid in England for autonomous drone logistics so that every hospital has a drone port transporting samples, medical devices, chemotherapy, um, drugs and other things and everyone said it, you'll never make it happen, this is England, you can't do this. So let's see what the Chief Executive of the National Health Service, Amanda Pritchard, had to say about it. Delivering chemo by drone is just another example of how the NHS will stop at nothing to ensure that patients with cancer get the treatment they need as promptly as possible, while also, in this case, cutting costs and carbon emissions. The NHS has always been at the forefront of medical innovation. It's clear the pace of change and improvement is only accelerating as our fantastic staff seek to make the most of life-changing advances to improve patients' lives. So Amanda has over £150 billion in her budget each year, which is quite a good budget to have. So that drone flight took place between Portsmouth Hospital and the Isle of Wight, where patients have to travel to the mainland for their chemotherapy because you can't get it there in time because the chemotherapy will decay once it's been prepared. It takes 20 minutes in drone flight. So we're now undertaking trials um, to see that we can get that launch. We're in Northumbria as well, delivering medical supplies in remote areas up there. So we can make it happen. UK satellites and ground-based beacons are going to be autonomously controlling this. We're not going to get it all done this year or next, but that's the destination of travel. Wow, next, Rachel Grimaldi, incredible, an anaesthetic registrar who, when she was looking after patients ventilated with COVID, they were awake, but they couldn't communicate. So she would write down standard medical phrases on a little pad, show it to the patients, and then give them a list of possible options. They could point to it, but they just couldn't talk to her. And thus, Card Medic was formed. And what Rachel realized was that it's not just people who are intubated, it's people whose first language isn't English. So now, Rachel's just raised over a million pounds for her startup. The Card Medic app and platform allows you to speak to someone in any language, pre-translated medical phrases. You can pick them from a menu. So as a urologist, I ask about six questions generally. So they're all there. And the range of responses that a patient can select. So I don't have to wait for the translator. I can start to get that medical information straight away. Incredible. Timper Health, Chris Ramdu, wow, amazing. I think the world's leading smartphone otoscope. Done a deal with the Boots Walgreens Alliance now. It's in every Boots hearing test centre in the United Kingdom. It's just expanding in Walgreens now, so you can have your ears examined by a technician in a hearing centre. They can remove the earwax and you can have your hearing aid fitted immediately. 250,000 people have already had this service in the UK and the United States. They video every single one. It's been analysed by AI, not a single episode of trauma to the eardrum. How incredible is that? Amazing. Now you're in for a treat. Proximy. Nadine Hashash Haram, who's been to speak at this event. This is what she's doing. Incredible. Imagine a global network of borderless, digitally connected operating rooms brimming with the world's best surgeons. Intelligent operating rooms, unburdened by geography or time where every single interaction is recorded, connected, reviewed and stored to shape and improve best practice. A digital continuum of surgical expertise designed to reduce variation in care. Every touch, sound, piece of technology, every patient outcome. The paradigm of surgery and healthcare is changing. 
It is being reimagined by the operating system of the operating room. Proximy is a centralized platform designed to scale expertise beyond the four walls of an operating room. This once analog environment is now a digitally connected and data-driven operating system designed to improve global healthcare, creating a platform that brings the best surgeons, AI technologies, and application partners into any operating room around the world. Connected Surgical Care. How amazing is that? Nadine is a full-time consultant plastic surgeon at Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital in London has just raised £80 million to digitise everything we do in the operating theatre. Just incredible. This next one, Saif Ahmed. Wow, an oncologist from Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge, the world's first point-of-care diagnostic for neutrophils. Neutropenia accepts this 50,000 patients each year who are on chemotherapy are admitted to NHS hospitals with suspected uh, neutropenic sepsis. Single finger prick of blood in this lateral flow test allows you to tell if someone's got no white cells, normal or high, so you can start their treatment early. So quickly, some of the companies we've been through. In our first year, when I was told it wasn't part, I presented here in 2015, said we're going to start this program, about 40 companies. Year two, here we go, about 50 or 60 companies. Year three, moving up to nearly 70 companies. Year four, I think we got to 80 companies on that slide, and now I can't fit the companies on the slides. There are so many. So there's just one slide to tell you our data. In six years, we have created 423 new life science companies. That is 8% of the UK life science industry from a program from the NHS that I co-designed when I came here and met Daniel Kraft 10 years ago. How amazing is that? They have benefited over 130 million patients and professionals and users through their innovations. We now have over 1,000 clinical entrepreneurs on our program, making it the world's largest entrepreneurial training program in healthcare and life science. And between them, in their first six years, they raised over a billion dollars in funding. So the first unicorn to arise from the Clinical Entrepreneur Program is the Clinical Entrepreneur Program and all our amazing startups. I always said we could do it, and we have. But actually, I wanted to show you, save till last, what I think the greatest innovation in healthcare is. I think it's the best. I see 2,000 new innovations a year in my role at NHS saying that this is the greatest thing. I think it is. I'll see what you think. Bear, we've seen loads of great tech here. I don't think anything beats what I'm about to show you. And that is the healthcare workforce. That is this year's cohort of our clinical entrepreneurs on the stairs at the Royal Institution three weeks ago in central London. There's the statue of Michael Faraday. This is the place where electromagnetic induction was discovered and demonstrated to the world. And much like NextMed, our entrepreneurs three weeks ago pitched at our big event there. And I would argue that it's actually our workforce, our healthcare staff, who utilize all that great technology, who put it into the clinical pathways, are in fact the greatest innovation, human beings in what we're doing. So they are so great and so good. Rather than just me show you some slides, I thought I'd better bring some human slides with me. So I have four of our clinical entrepreneurs who they haven't ever pitched on a stage in America before, so this is going to be a new experience. In America, you teach people to pitch from when they're toddlers, I think. You're really good at it. So guys, do you want to come out and come and join me on the stage now? So, so we have Ben, Stephanie, Malone, and Ahmed, all who have different... Now, I time in England, I time them, and I then clap them if they overspeak their time, but they were all a bit uh, apprehensive today, so I'm gonna, I've given them two minutes, and they're going to tell you about their startups and what they do. We'll start with you, Ben. Thank you. Um, hi, guys. So, uh, in a time where we're spending over four trillion dollars now in healthcare, um, we can no longer, we cannot afford the one in four patients who no show to their hospital appointments, costing the U.S. healthcare system 150 billion dollars a year. But that's one in four patients who can't access care when they need to. And the question we should be asking is why. 
So my name's Ben, I'm the co-founder and co-CEO of Deep Medical. Um, and at Deep Medical, we've created a cutting edge solution which harnesses the power of AI to find out who's at risk of no-show two weeks before their appointment with 90% accuracy. And it's so much more than just forgetting and reminding. Actually, what we're starting to unpick here are the underlying inequalities in our society that are resulting in people not turn up. So it's the elderly man who's too scared to travel during rush hour traffic. It's your single mother who can't afford to take time off work. It's your immigrant family who might not understand the complexities about what is being written in them in their letters. So what we do at Deep Medical is we give the who, the why, and the what, so hospital staff can do what they do best, connect. We've been live now across 1.2 million appointments a year, where we're uh, reducing their no-show rates by 50% in the first two weeks. So what I have to ask from you is to help us scale this product out into the US um, and actually deliver equitable access to care. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you, Ben. You can have a seat now. Um, Incredible. I told you the wait list, up to 7 million people, 80% are waiting for outpatients. That's 5.6 million. Ben Startup on its own can identify the spare capacity and fill, if this works, he'll fill every one of those. How incredible, is that? what difference to patient care is that going to make? Amazing. Stephanie, beat that. <laughs> no pressure. Okay. So my name is Dr. Stephanie Campbell, and I believe that everyone deserves access to great eye care. So what is great eye care? Well, I think it's three key things. The first one is early diagnosis. The second one is prompt treatment when you need it. And the third one is truly excellent communication. And as an eye professional myself, I haven't always been able to give that, and I desperately wanted to, to every single patient. In fact, I got tired and I got fed up of explaining to patients that they had irreversible sight loss simply because they'd waited too long to be seen. And that was really heartbreaking for the patient. It was really heartbreaking for me. And this was with, within a fantastic system with excellent drugs, excellent doctors, excellent teams. But it doesn't matter what amazing surgeries and what amazing drugs we have if we can't get it to the right patient at exactly the right time. And so that's why I set up Oco Health in order to allow remote patient monitoring in ophthalmology. Because the problem wasn't that we don't have great service and great care, the problem was that the monitoring was all happening in the hospital. And patients don't deteriorate at hospital, they deteriorate at home. So, Oco Health is a very simple software medical device on a smartphone that monitors eyesight. But we're not talking about an eye chart on a phone, no. We're talking about simple video games, no letters, no eye charts, and these very, very simple video games that take five minutes, three times a week, collect brand new sets of big data about how we see. And by looking at that over time, we're able to detect deterioration early. And we're able to get people to the doctor to be seen promptly for treatment. And patients say it makes them feel in control of their eye disease because they can self-monitor. And it gives them the confidence to have meaningful conversations. So speaking about meaningful conversations, I've met incredible people here this week. But if you think we need to have a meaningful conversation um, ahead of my Series A next year, there may be some room this year, um, I'd love to speak to you. And if you think this technology could change your world as well, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephanie. So, great pitch, but you were 30 seconds over. I gave you two minutes. Malone, I'm going to be a bit tougher on you. Right. So, Impressive. Ben, first raise, three million pounds. Stephanie has raised about three million pounds. Malone is yet to raise, so his earlier stage. But you don't have to raise a million pounds to change a million lives. And what he is doing is amazing. Malone. All right. Um, good morning, America. Um, I wanted to start by asking the audience a quick question. Could you please raise your hands if you know what meningitis looks like? And could you keep your hands raised if you know what meningitis looks like on darker skin? 
it, almost everyone's hands went down. Um, so this was something that I noticed when I was at medical school. A lot of the time we were being taught how to identify signs and symptoms from the perspective of white skin. But I would sit there in the lecture theater and ask myself, if I had that same condition, what would it look like on me? And I would often ask the professors, the doctors, the physicians, what does this look like on darker skin? And no one could give me an accurate answer. However, everyone could give me an answer of what meningitis looks like on white skin. So I decided to take matters into my own hands and create a handbook on this. It's called Mind the Gap, a clinical handbook of signs and symptoms on darker skin. Since launch in August 2020, the book has been read over 500,000 times in more than 75% of countries globally. And California is actually one of the leading regions in the world. Um, this has been featured in Forbes, Time, and the Washington Post. And through the experience of writing that book, it allowed me to see that actually the problems for black and people of color in the healthcare system are a lot deeper than we think. At the moment in the UK, there are statistics such as black women being five times more likely to die during childbirth. And unfortunately, at the moment, people don't trust the healthcare system. So what I'm working on is building a telehealth solution which allows black and people of color to have somewhere they can trust, to have a healthcare service that they can engage in. And my ask from everyone in the crowd today is if anyone is looking to be an advisor or technical roles in our team, we'd love to speak to you. I think race relations in the US are a lot more advanced and we can learn a lot from different people in the room. So thank you very much. Brilliant, thank you Malone, go and have a seat. He's a medical student. How amazing is that? I'm not, I'm the national director for innovation for the world's largest healthcare system. I'm never gonna solve that problem. But Mike Malone, if we can empower him to do it, do you know, I think he just might. Ahmed, two minutes, sir. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Ahmed Wobi. I have a background in neuroscience from Oxford University, where I studied movement disorders through deep brain stimulation, and then I worked as a clinician in the NHS for seven years before I founded TONUS. At TONUS, we want to keep people moving better for longer. We know people are living longer, but are they living better? Are they moving better? When people get to the age of 50, we've lost about 10% of our muscle bulk, and for every decade subsequently, we lose 15% of our strength and our power. This is a really powerful statistic, but we haven't been able to fix this, and people are not be, uh, being able to be empowered for a way to control this. So what we're going to do at TONUS is support people with tailored longevity performance apparel. And we are the only wearable that does this. Our sensor fusion uh, technology is able to track the movement of your joints, your muscles, and your limbs. And combined with our AI interface and our machine learning algorithm, we can give personalized feedback and insights. And these biomechanic uh, kinematic markers allow us to see into disease prediction, injury prevention and modification. One of the things we're looking at is powered movement and you can do this through exoskeletons, so soft exoskeletons and artificial muscles. You've heard of an electric bike, well Tonus is going to bring you the electric hike. And one of the things that we think is that everyone needs a, a unique, personalized, tailored solution. So at Tonus, we, we've done studies where we used 50 patients and we got them to go through multiple exercise uh, activities. We collected over 12,500 individual exercise movements and this led to millions of data points that we were able to validate the technology in comparison to a motion capture lab with the benefit of being able to be used anywhere at any time. So currently we have a fundraising round open, so our ask is to look for any investors and any collaborators that would like to deploy our, our technology uh, in, in pilots going forward. So yeah, if you, like, if you think like us that people should be able to keep moving better for longer, we'd love to have a chat with you. Thank you. Great, Ahmed. Have a seat. Well done. So um, I don't pick winners. I'm not Elon Musk. I can't do that. What we do is we provide a culture, an environment, in which people who dream, people who desire something better, who want to create something, who want the autonomy to do that, we give them a safe space to learn, to test, and to trial, and to grow. I have 1,075 of these. This is about 0.6% of my program. Imagine what that's like. Imagine what you could do in healthcare at scale. So what I thought I would do now is, because we've got these are the people on the front line, why should you in America be interested in coming and bringing your technology, your ideas, your problems that you've faced and solved to the National Health Service? Because we want you to do that. So I'm going to have a, I'm a bit nervous about this, I'm going to have a very open conversation about the good, the bad and the ugly 
directly with our startups of how they're getting on in the NHS, what's good about it, and what's perhaps not so good about it. So first question we'll start with is, so the NHS, it is turning 75 this year in July. Um, and despite being free at the point of care for everyone, there are still healthcare inequalities right across our system. And it's really important with innovation that we tackle at the start those healthcare inequalities. What are you doing in your innovation in the NHS to address healthcare inequalities? Ben, do you want to start with that? Thanks, Tony. Um, so, you know, if you have a long-term condition and you miss two of your appointments, your all-cause mortality goes up eightfold. That means you're eight times more likely to die than the other patient. If you've got diabetes and you miss an appointment, your HbA1c goes up by 30%, on average about seven minimolar. Um, and if you have breast uh, screening, a breast screening appointment, not turning up to that increases your chances of having a stage three and four breast cancer by 100%. So what we're doing is we've done research and with those demographics who are at risk of no-show, and we found out, was it education? Because I keep hearing education is the problem. And actually, over 70% of the people that we interviewed, uh, uh, which were 200 in total, uh, said that it wasn't education that was their problem. It was because they couldn't take time off work. So what we started to do was actually reserve those high-value times in the weekends, in the evenings, for those patients from these demographics so that they can get those appointments first, and then, to actually think, well, if there's still no showing, we reach out, and if they still don't respond, we bring somebody else in and get them off the list. So that's how we view equity and access, and we're challenging that. Good, that's good. Malone, I'm not gonna ask all of you each question. Do you wanna answer that really quickly? Um, what are you doing in yeah, healthcare so politics? I think for us, it's about building with a lot of intentionality. Um, like I mentioned, black women are five times more likely to die during childbirth, and there's also other statistics such as you being 100% more likely um, to have stage four breast cancer when you show up on arrival at the clinic. Um, for us, it's building with the community in mind, asking them what are the reasons why they don't trust certain things, and building with that in mind. So just making sure that we're building with the community. Yeah, no, I think that's really good. And do you know, we've opened up, we didn't call it the Doctor Entrepreneur Programme when we started. I was committed to calling it the clinical entrepreneur program because I wanted nurses and allied health practitioners, dentists and pharmacists and clinical scientists to join us. Malone's mentioned a shocking statistic. If you are a black woman in our country and you're pregnant, you are five times more likely to die in childbirth than you are if you're white. That's a shocking statistic and we have to deal with it. Not a single doctor on our program stepped forward to deal with that. This year, three midwives have stepped forward with separate startups to do that. So if we didn't have them on our program, we wouldn't be helping to tackle this issue. So that's really amazing. Right, next question. So the NHS has one of the world's largest healthcare data sets. And you may have seen a few weeks ago, we announced we're spending 250 million pounds to create a federated data platform, the pipe work that joins all that data up. In my view, it will become the world's leading and most accessible live learning healthcare data set. So this is a great opportunity. How are some of you using that data in your innovation? Because it's one of our advantages in the NHS. Stephanie, how are you using data in yours? We're working with uh, two of the leading teaching hospitals, huge teaching hospitals, who have a very high throughput macular degeneration service. And, and we're using um, those very standardized encounters because they're such big systems. They have very standardized protocols. The patients aren't on 100 different treatment regimens. And what that means is that we can get high quality tagged longitudinal data uh, from those um, so that we can get good ground truth for the AI that we're developing. So I don't think you know there's any better place to do that than, than the NHS. So in the pandemic, every single intensive care unit in the United Kingdom shared their research data. We led the world in research trials in COVID as we joined our data sets up. We discovered dexamethasone. We 
disproved hydroxychloroquine and a variety of other things that came forward. It's really powerful and that's what our entrepreneurs have access to. Ahmed, how are you using data and access to it in the NHS in what you're doing? So in a similar way to Stephanie, the, we've seen the, the richness of this data. It's so powerful to have very specific population outcomes. And we're looking at longevity, so we're looking particularly at older adults. And uh, in England, in the south of England, there's a region called Cornwall, which has the highest population of older adults. And we can focus our technology in pilots. So we're looking at patients that have sarcopenia, osteoporosis, Parkinson's disease. Without the, the beauty of this data set, we wouldn't know where to go. So for us, it's be able to get our product in, in validation in, with the right users uh, over a, a short period of time. So this is the power of the NHS data set. So I don't think we see it anywhere else in the world. Okay, that's really cool. So last question, and I'll put this to each of you. So um, it is a huge healthcare. It's the biggest single, uh, largest single payer in healthcare on the planet, the National Health Service. And it might seem like one system, but actually it's made up of thousands of different organizations. So it's really complex. And I was hearing speakers earlier in the week talk about Medicare and Medicaid and saying, that's complex. I think we can compete with you on complexity in public systems in England. So what's been good about working in the NHS, but I also want you to share openly where your struggles and challenges have been, and what would you say to startups or companies from the United States who want, what would your piece of advice, has to be quite quick because we're tight on time, so just a couple of sentences each, Ben. Um, yeah, I mean, good point, bad point, and why should people from the US come and work with us? Sure. Uh, good point is, um, like, like Tony mentioned, like the problems that the NHS is facing are really clear. So in terms of designing products, it's been quite easy to tie things and unify what all of the key stakeholders are looking for because of that. Some of the challenges, as I'm sure is everywhere, but particularly in the UK, we're very bureaucratic. So there's a lot of layers, and change management is not the easiest thing and can take time. So what I would say to people coming to the US is uh, do your research, find the right partners, and, and, and align to where the values are. Okay, that's good, Stephanie. Um, great thing is that there is an enthusiastic base of academic clinicians who are really keen to get stuck into new technologies that are going to make them system better. And the first question they won't ask you is, how do we make this pay? Because of the, the financial incentives are, are quite aligned in our system, so it's a really good place to go early. The downside is, is it can take time to get a clinical study set up. You know, the ethics process is rigorous, and also there's things like commercial governance as well to go through. So that takes a bit of time. My advice would be, again, just like you said, Ben, get the partners, find the right partners. You know, you can reach out to these academic clinicians in these, uh, you know, teaching hospitals or else district general hospitals um, in the community, and you will find incredible people to That's work good with. That's good, and good. I get approached lots here this week. People have said, to me, who should I be working with in the United Kingdom? And I've already started making those connections with some of our centers. Malone, what's good, what's bad, and why should people in the US come and work with us in the NHS? Yeah, um, so I think what's good um, is the fact that there is a lot of teaching hospitals and there's, there's a lot of universities which allow you to be able to carry out like your clinical trials, some of your research for your innovations. So we're great, at, I agree, we're great at testing and trialing. We're really good at that. Um, I think the bad part is more society in the UK, like race relations are not as advanced in the UK compared to the US, so starting the conversation is often very difficult for me. Um, in terms of advice, I would say know your value proposition. I think a lot of the time in the States, the value proposition I often hear is reduce cost, increase efficiency. And in the oh. NHS, you have to think differently. All right, Malin, that's really good. So I'd say we're great at testing and trying, less good at adopting and scaling. You're better at that in the US. Really quickly, Ahmed, three quick answers. Okay, I'll try to be quick. Uh, so what's good is the NHS Clinical Entrepreneur Program. Without it, we wouldn't be here, and it promotes leaders and innovation. Okay, come on, what's the challenge, challenge? is for us specifically, the employment of exercise and wellness through social prescribing is relatively new in the NHS and in England. Hopefully it's gonna get there, but we're baby steps. And advice would be find the, the key leaders, the key thought partners, collaborate with them early, and then you'll be guided throughout your process. Amazing, so look, we're gonna be around for the rest of the day until the conference closes. Come and find us in the break. We'd love to speak to you. We'd love to bring some of the great American stuff over to the NHS and find partners to help us test and trial some of this great stuff in the US. Thank you so much for your time. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, 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 one second.
This is awesome. Um, amazing to see how this is manifested. Kudos to you and your team. Uh, what's the best way to reach you uh, and to so invest? Just connect with me on LinkedIn. I do that, and then we can exchange emails and take that forward. And I think we need to start the next MedHealth Fund to invest in all of this. Uh, well, two. that's not a bad uh, idea. And three, just bigger picture, there's huge uh, workforce challenges in the NHS, UH, US, and beyond. And I think when we did a podcast conversation, you mentioned you used to be looked upon, a downward looked in terms of anybody trying to be a clinician, an entrepreneur. How is this sort of program keeping folks engaged and in the workforce? So it's been incredible. We've, on our program, it's now 300 clinicians have returned to working in the NHS because they can be an entrepreneur as well. And um, we are going to make an announcement later this summer. I think it's already out in the public domain where we've now persuaded our healthcare system that backing things like this, innovation and entrepreneurship in healthcare. So from later this year, we have 30,000 trainee doctors. We're starting with them, funded by the National Health Service. Everyone will be able to take one day a week of their time that will count towards their training to do research, education, quality improvement, but innovation and entrepreneurship too. And I don't think that's, you imagine 30,000 doctors having a day a week to do that. Wow. And that's come about because you invited me here 10 years ago. It would never have happened without it. Magic. Um, so we have challenges with nursing students, pharmacy students, and others, and this program is an inspiration. How, is, you don't need a whole NHS system to do this sort of thing. What lesson, could you put NHS entrepreneurship program in a box to help other systems, small and large, do the similar program? So absolutely, the Australian government have worked in partnership with us, and in three states in Australia, the program is now being rolled out there, and there's no, charge for this. We don't make any money on it. What we want to is we want to work in partnership. How can we build great life science companies together? How can we develop trading relationships? So now the Republic of Ireland, Northern Ireland, Scotland, uh, Australia, we're in conversations with Sweden and Finland and other governments and, uh, and the Ugandan government as well to look at how we might actually build collaboration in healthcare through startups and through entrepreneurship. There are businesses in every single country in the world. Could this be that route through to getting the latest, greatest things into healthcare across the planet? I think it could. Right, so the challenge for everybody here and online and beyond is to learn from this program and, and build versions of your own. So thanks everybody. Great, thank you very much. <laughs>